From the editorial team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, a show where I investigate the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. When you become a public figure, your identity is swiftly, suddenly compressed into one immutable image. You must somehow control it, or else it will control you. Some people, like, say, the Kardashians, they live to capitalize on this. For others, it's an uncomfortable reality. Melinda Gates realized the weight of that reality when she was dating a very young Bill Gates. Say when we go to a restaurant, if he was running late and I would sit down at the table, the way the waitress or waiter might approach me when I was alone versus when he arrived was completely different. For two decades, Melinda worked hard to keep a low profile. She enrolled her kids in school under her maiden name. She spoke out rarely. And when she did begin to give interviews, she talked almost exclusively about her philanthropic work. And this is still mostly the case. But more recently, Melinda is finding her voice. She's doing her own investing. She has just published a memoir, The Moment of Lift. And perhaps most powerfully, Melinda is sharing more about her own life. Few of us will walk into the public eye that comes with marrying the second richest man in the world. But thanks to the internet, we all must curate a professional identity for ourselves. We all must choose just how much of our private lives we wish to let seep in. We are all confronted with decisions like the ones Melinda has had to make, and there's something we can glean from her thinking. Here's Melinda. So Melinda, who did you hope to be growing up? Well, when I was young, I really wanted to be a working mom. I always knew I wanted to have children, and I knew I wanted to work. And I think as I got into high school, I really wanted to be an executive in the computer industry. I was good at math, luckily, in high school. And as my teacher brought computers into the school, I fell in love with them. And so I knew I wanted to be some sort of executive in computer field. And Melinda, this was in Texas, and this was in the 70s and 80s that you were going to school. What did you learn during that time that made you think that computers were the path forward for you? So... This teacher, this female teacher I had, I went to an all-girls Catholic high school in Dallas, Texas, and she was my math teacher, and she went off to a small conference, and she saw these Apple II computers and came back and advocated to the head nun that she should get, we should get about a half dozen in the school. And when they came into the school, I loved the puzzles and the logic of them, but I could also see that they were going to change things. And my parents bought a computer very early, actually an Apple III that only very few were made of. And my parents were running a small real estate investment business on the side. We knew my dad's engineering salary wouldn't put all four of us kids through any college, which my parents always gave us the message we could go to any college. We knew my dad's engineering salary wouldn't cover that. But this small real estate investment business that my parents started that we all worked on as siblings, and I kept the books on an Apple III, I knew that the way computers were just starting to be used in home and business was going to change the world. As you are thinking about going to college, you then go to Duke. You study computer science, right? I do. And am I remembering right? You did a five-year degree, so you also came out with an MBA? Right. And as you looked for your first job, what was important to you? Yes. So I think it's first important to say that I picked Duke University at the time because they had just gotten a big grant from IBM. So they had this two gleaming new personal computer labs, which most schools didn't have back then. This would have been back in 1982. And so then I coded all through college. I coded particularly with men because we're mostly just young men in computer science. And then, as you said, I went on and got my business degree at Duke, came out with my MBA, my computer science degrees. And when I went out and looked in industry, I wanted to join a company that was changing the world. And when I eventually interviewed that spring uh, before I graduated with Microsoft, I literally came out and I remember calling my parents. I was in Seattle. They were back in Dallas saying, oh, my gosh, mom and dad, if this company makes me an offer, I won't be able to refuse it. They are changing the world. And I want to be part of that. So Microsoft, when you first got there, well, tell us about the early days. Well, the early days, there were only about 1,400 employees. There certainly were not very many women who had technical degrees. In fact, very, very few. We were creating products that we knew Excel was not out yet. Microsoft Word was not was in a character-based form. We didn't have Windows yet. That hadn't come out. And it was an environment. There were less than 1,400 employees. We were in four buildings, and it was hard charging. You were in the first class of MBAs, right? I was. They hired 10 MBAs that year, which was their first, quote, class. 
and I was the only woman, the rather nine guys. And that didn't seem that odd to me, honestly, because in computer science, when I was studying it at Duke, after freshman year, there were just so few women. And so when I would be in the computer lab, I was always coding with guys. And I actually got really good at running teams that were all guys. I, I would sort of rise up, even when I was coding in college, I would sort of rise up as the leader and manager. So when I got to Microsoft, it just didn't seem that unusual to me. We were creating products that changed the world. And for me, the th great thing was that at Microsoft, it was very merit-based. And so my chance for advancement was so rapid there because I knew how to code. I knew how to run teams. I knew how to manage things when I came in. And so very, very quickly, I moved out of product marketing into actually development of products where I was running the whole team. And they just kept giving me larger and larger teams. And then by the time I left, I was uh, in the consumer division running a team of many, many products at over 1,700 employees. You've said a couple of times now that you, you were the only woman or one of very few women in your classes at Duke when you got to Microsoft. Can you think back to how you felt about that? You know, at Duke, I didn't really think about it very much. I mean, in the computer labs, it was me and the guys. But I had a lot of female friends when I was at Duke as well. So I coded with the guys, but I had lots of female friends. So in business school, I was working with very equal mix of teams of men and young women. When I got to Microsoft, there were not very many technical women However, there were women working in marketing and corporate communications. And so what I did at Microsoft was I cultivated a mix of male and female friends. And I benefited, honestly, by having male and female friends. So I didn't honestly find it that odd. I found the culture a bit difficult, though, because it was very male-led, very high testosterone, very aggressive culture. And that piece was a bit certainly harder for me. And I was very aware of that at the time. You know, in the book that you have just written, you talk about that first year and a half as being really hard, like you maybe even thought about quitting. Can you remember what changed for you over time? Yes, I loved it at first, but then as I started rising in the ranks and I could see how aggressive the culture was, you had to go into every meeting knowing all your facts, you know, standing up for your point of view, being willing to argue it at the table. I knew how to play that game. I could play that game. I did that game, but I didn't like myself very much. And so as I would go home and think about it more, especially about a year and a half, two years in, I thought, you know, I might want to, I might just leave. And I had been told by a consulting firm, and they stayed in touch with me, that I would basically have a job offer there anytime I wanted it if I got a couple years experience. So I thought I might go and do that. And then as I was at home and reflecting on it, I thought more and more, no, 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 no. I love this company. I love building products. I love being on the front end. What I don't like so much is the culture. And so what I decided to do was just try on being myself. I thought, I'm going to just go in and be myself. And if they don't like it, they can take it or leave it, because I'll just leave then and go get another job. Belinda, how did you figure that out, though? Because I, I definitely remember early in my career having that feeling. like I figured it out somehow on my own. I take a lot of time for quiet. Back then, I jogged a lot. And so once I was willing to say to myself, you know, I don't need this job. I could go somewhere else. I could move somewhere else. Doesn't matter. Then I was able to say, well, well, what would it take for me to stay in this job? And that's how I figured out, well, just try being yourself. I didn't actually think it would work. Um, so I thought, okay, I'll probably have to leave in three or four months. You know, I probably won't do well here. And the more I was myself, the more I could attract people around me. And the more I looked for managers to work under who were willing to have that kind of culture and we supported each other and had one another's backs, the happier I became and the more I was able to recruit amazingly talented people to my teams. Did you have any mentors during that time? I surrounded myself with other women. I write in the book about one of my best friends, Charlotte Guyman, and I could see her working in her own style. She was a bit older than me. She had worked at HP and then gone back to business school. And Charlotte was just herself. And I thought, well, that seems to be working for her, so maybe I should do that. So I could often talk things through with her. I had other female friends I would talk things through about, are you unhappy about this? What do you think about that? And then eventually, I actually was working for Patty Stonecipher in the consumer division. She later came to work for us at Microsoft. And Patty was somebody that I learned a tremendous amount for, about how to push yourself and hold your ground, but also how to be yourself. So you talk about learning so much from Patty. What lessons specifically can you share from that? I learned from Patty that you don't have to believe everything that people above you are telling you. 
that, okay, you have to get approval for your project, you got to get the resources for your project, and then you just got to release yourself to keep going. And when you check in the next year, you just got to explain to them why you did it your way and maybe not the way they thought. But they approved it in the end. So she taught me that, like, to really listen in the meetings and listen for what we needed. And once we got our yes, kind of take it and go home and do it, do, you know, do your very best. And I used to tell my teams, I would run teams for a year that, you know, we always had to be thinking about what's the meeting going to be like in the next year, a year from now, because those meetings, as harsh as they were, made us better. It's like when you're taking a, a college class, you have to be learning and studying all along the way. And if you do, the final's not going to actually be that hard for you. You've got to be thinking about what am I learning and what might be on the final. If we always kept in mind, what are the tough questions we might get asked by management? Those are the ones that are going to make us better. So we better be living that out and working that all year. And then we had, and so going to the meetings wasn't actually that hard because we'd usually figured out what they wanted us to do and we'd either done it or we had good reasons we weren't going to do it. Coming up after the break, our reporter Caroline Fairchild brings us some tips on deciding what to share about yourself at the office. Today's show is brought to you by Zebit. Having zero of anything isn't always something to celebrate, unless we're talking Zebit. Zebit believes it can change your whole perspective on zero forever. Zebit is an e-commerce site that lets you buy now and pay over time without paying interest, whether you're looking for a watch, an espresso machine, or a new TV. There's zero cost to join, no membership fees or late fees. There's zero impact on your credit score because Zebit doesn't check your credit. And of course, there's zero interest. That's the point. Zebit has more than 50,000 products in their marketplace with brand names like Xbox, Sony, Apple, GoPro, and Fitbit. From electronics to barbecues, furniture, and more, Zebit has everything you need for when you need it. Sign up for Zebit today at zebit.com slash hello Monday and get $2,500 credit to shop the Zebit marketplace at zero interest and zero cost to join. That's Z-E-B-I-T dot com slash Hello Monday for $2,500 of interest-free credit. Zebit.com slash Hello Monday. Today's show is brought to you by Sunbasket. No matter your lifestyle, Sunbasket caters to your kind of healthy. And that makes a huge difference for someone like me. I get home from a long day of work and I've got half an hour maybe to get the baby in bed and between my wife and I to figure out who's going to make supper. With a delicious meal plan like paleo, carb-conscious, gluten-free, Mediterranean, diabetes-friendly, and vegan, plus quick and easy recipes, I can enjoy a dinner full of organic produce and clean ingredients in as little as 15 minutes. Try mouthwatering sunbasket dishes like healthy shrimp pad thai with rice noodles and sugar snap peas, or fresh fettuccine primavera with creamy feta sauce. Those are just a couple of 18 weekly recipes to choose from. Everything is pre-measured and easy to prep. You can get a healthy and delicious meal on the table in as little as 15 minutes. So go to sunbasket.com slash hello Monday to get $80 off. That's basically getting dinner on the table for less than $9 a serving for your first four weeks. Visit sunbasket.com slash hello Monday to get $80 off today. All right, back to the show. So this week I asked Caroline to dig into what it means to maintain our professional image. Hey, Caroline. Hey, Jesse. So we just heard from Melinda Gates, and she was talking about the importance of being yourself at the workplace. But how do you do that in an increasingly collaborative workplace? Choosing what to share about your personal life at work can be challenging, particularly if there's something that may be perceived to be negative about you. This made me think about a former colleague of mine named David Flank, who very publicly shared his struggles with alcoholism on LinkedIn. He titled the post, My name is David Flank. I'm a leader in tech and I'm an alcoholic. The post really struck a chord with over 2,200 comments. When I saw that, it really told me that even if you have vulnerability at work, you can still be seen as a leader. So that's a really great example about David. I remember that post. And the thing that I remember about it was how vulnerable he was, how many people responded to that vulnerability with their own stories. And I think he was the stronger for it. But of course, that's not always the way that professional identity works. Right. So here are some factors you can really consider when trying to figure out how to curate your professional identity. First, share things that make you relatable. And at the end of the day, if you just present yourself at work as this perfectly curated person who is doing nothing but working all the time, you become unapproachable. And that can really impact your career. So in ways that make you comfortable, figure out how to show your colleagues that you are a human, you make mistakes, you have faults, and just be authentic. Whether you choose to share a lot or just something really small, it has to be true to who you are. 
That's a great point. What else do you have? Here's another thing. If it's going to impact how you present yourself at work, if you're going through something personally or you've had a bad day, it's important to figure out how to disclose that in a way that you're comfortable with. For example, if there's a death in the family or something challenging going on in your life that's going to make it hard for you to do your job effectively, you have to at least tell your manager. It can be awkward, of course, but if you don't disclose this important detail, you run into the danger of people assuming that you're just not doing good work. And here's really my last tip, and this has to go with what you disclose, not just in person, but online. Curate what channels are public and which are private. And if you're deciding whether or not to share something on a public social media channel that your coworkers have access to, ask yourself, why am I sharing this? What's the point? I think that's a really great point, Caroline, and it reinforces the reminder that we all need that when you post anything on the internet, it becomes part of your professional identity if it's findable. Right. It just is. Exactly. And none of us really have the answers here. We're all figuring this out as we go, which is why we want to hear from you, our listeners. How do you choose what to share about yourself at work, either online or in person? Let us know. Send us a voice memo to hello Monday at LinkedIn.com, and we hope to share your thoughts on next week's show. Or share your thoughts on LinkedIn, you know, in the public sphere with the hashtag Hello Monday. Thank you, Caroline. Thanks, Jesse. All right. Back to my conversation with Melinda Gates. Tell me about meeting Bill. <laughs> so I met Bill within a few months of starting Microsoft, which I guess in hindsight shouldn't be that surprising. It was a small company. It was less than 1,400 employees when I joined. There were only four buildings. The building I was in was next to the building that Bill was in. I mean, they were all in very close proximity. And so I had met him once at a dinner in New York a few months earlier, but when he finally asked me out, it was a couple of months later, and we were all working very late on the weekends. Uh, you'd work late. Usually the culture was you work late on Friday night. You came in on Saturday till about three or four o'clock, and then you kind of didn't work usually Saturday or Sunday, the rest of Saturday and Sunday. So it was a late Saturday afternoon. I'd been working. I came out of my building, and just literally, lo and behold, Bill was coming out of his building. Our cars happened to be parked near one another, and so we struck up a conversation, and uh, he asked me out. And I figured out as we were talking that he'd been thinking about asking me out. But anyway, he asked me out for two weeks from Friday night. And I was like, two weeks from Friday night? And that was like, I, don't, I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, 22 years old. I have no idea what I'm doing. Call me closer to the date. And so, but he asked for my phone number and I gave it to him. And lo and behold, he called me about an hour and later said, well, what about tonight? Is this spontaneous enough for you? Because I teased him about not being spontaneous enough. And I said, huh? And he said, well, I have a computer dinner and a user group event, and then maybe I could go out for a glass of wine downtown. I thought, oh my God, this guy is so booked up. But I thought, okay, he's putting himself out there. He's being spontaneous. So I agreed to a glass of wine later that night. I love that story. Did that leave you feeling conflicted at the time? Well, I think one of the important things to know was I went out on, with him on a date once, but I, you know, because I was curious. I thought, okay, well, that'll be interesting. I didn't think it was going to lead to anything else. So, and then I went out on a date with him twice and I thought, okay, I mean, I just wasn't, I, I didn't think it was going to lead to anything long-term. And I was dating other people, just to be clear at the time. I was also dating other people and I was clear with him that I was dating other people. Like, I, w I wasn't interested in being serious about anybody and neither was he. I mean, he looks back and he, he even said recently, yeah, I was pretty much married to Microsoft at the time. So I didn't really think it was going anywhere. I thought maybe I'll go out on after that two or three dates and that'll be it, right? I do remember calling home though and talking to my parents and my mom saying to me in particular, are you sure it's a good idea to be dating the boss? <laughs> and and um, I said, no, 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 mom, this isn't serious. I'm just going to do it a few times and that'll be it. And lo and behold, you know, it led to a long-term relationship. The thing I had to be really clear about inside of Microsoft and as I had very tight boundaries and my teams knew it, they absolutely knew I was explicit. I do not go home and talk to Bill about work because they needed to know that if I was helping them prepare for a meeting with Bill and Steve Ballmer, who was then also head of Microsoft, that if I was helping us prepare, that I wasn't going home and saying, well, so-and-so is nervous or so-and-so doesn't know what he or she is talking about. They had to know that I had their back. I was their manager, just like any other manager at Microsoft. So I had very bright lines around that. And people knew that. And in fact, sometimes it would be to my detriment because I would see other guys, you know, who are running teams, you know, if they happen to be riding down with Bill or Steve Ballmer in the elevator, they're going to use the opportunity to talk about something they want. 
I never used those opportunities. So in a way, it was harder for me. But I felt like that was absolutely for my own integrity and to be able to work there. And if I was going to date Bill, that was super important. But And the thing I think that's important to point out at the time is his whole personality was wrapped and entangled with Microsoft at the time. He was the founder of Microsoft. And, you know, I think one of the things over time that I've helped Bill work through is how do you separate yourself from this thing you absolutely built and loved and created, but also how do you become yourself and how do you have other things in the world that aren't just one company? And he ultimately wanted that for himself. He just wasn't there yet. And over time with the foundation, we were able, and kids were able to pull those things apart for him. There had to be a point, Melinda, where you became a public figure. Did it happen slowly over time, or was it was there a great unveil where you realized, oh, my life is different right now? Well, I think it's important to say here that I purposely did not want to be a public figure. I am a very private person, and I grew up in a family that believed in, in privacy. And so, and I could see what it was like for Bill to be out in public. I could see how people approached him. I could see the pros and cons of that. And I could also see as I was dating him what it was like for me when I would be, say, say when we go to a restaurant, if he was running late and I would sit down at the table, the way the waitress or waiter might approach me when I was alone versus when he arrived was completely different. So I saw the dichotomy there and I didn't want to be a public figure. I also, as we got married, I knew I wanted to have children, and I knew for them to grow up and be themselves, they needed privacy. They needed privacy to be their own people. And so I guarded and protected their privacy and mine so that we could step into their school environments first as who they were and who I was, not as the son or daughter of Bill Gates or the wife of Bill Gates. Over time, as our children started to grow up and became a bit older, and I felt they were you know, really surrounded by their friends and their school community for who they were. And as I got more and more involved in the foundation work, people started to write about the foundation being Bill Gates Foundation. And that started to bother me because the truth was we were running it equally. We knew that, but the world didn't know that because I wasn't speaking out. And so as I started thinking also about talking to my oldest daughter then, she was young, about using her voice in the world, I thought, I'm not actually role modeling that. I need to use my voice in the world. So I stepped out slowly over time. Bill absolutely supported me in that. Warren Buffett, uh, who also has his money in our foundation, he supported me in that from behind the scenes. And ultimately, I found my voice and used it in the world. And I started to realize that I could speak on behalf of things and bring voice to things in a different way than Bill could, and that that was important on behalf of women around the world. That tension of what you speak between wanting to do this work and being the face of this work and wanting to protect your children and protect yourself. Did you get advice on how to manage that tension? Was it something you had to learn by doing? I'm a watcher. I sit back and watch a lot and I listen. And so I would watch how other people did it in the press. I had just so much experience being around Bill, so much experience watching how people treated him and when he could truly be himself and when he couldn't, when he had to be a persona versus himself. And so I think I I mostly figured that out on my own. I actually was under pressure, to be honest, when we first got married from the Microsoft PR department to do things very differently than what I thought. And I had to stand up to them and say, no, I am not opening this house for anybody to come in. And no, I'm not going to sit beside my husband in some business interview. So I had to really learn to stand my ground I told Bill privately that if he ever really needed me, I would stand beside him, but that that was not my first choice. But if there was a day he needed me to do that when he was still working at Microsoft and and I was still at home with the kids. And sure enough, during the DOJ trial, I was five months pregnant and not my most attractive. And that was probably the first time I stepped out and stood behind Bill in front of cameras. As my friend said, she's clearly pregnant. (laughs) Coming up after the break, Melinda talks about leaving Microsoft. Today's show is brought to you by Captera. I'm a review person. This summer, I'm taking my family to Europe, and I read 35 reviews before I chose my hotel. When I choose a restaurant, I read the reviews. Pick out a new stroller for my son. Again, reviews. So it just makes sense that I'd turn to reviews when picking out software for a business. 
That's why I want to tell you about Captera. It's an efficient way to get educated fast about what will help you the most. You can read thousands of real software reviews and find the right software for your business at captera.com slash hello monday. Visit captera.com slash hello monday for free today to find the tools to make an informed software decision for your business. captera.com slash hello monday. Captera, that's C A P T E R R A dot com slash hello monday. Captera, software selection simplified. All right, back to my conversation with Melinda Gates. When did you leave Microsoft? So I worked at Microsoft for nine years. I started in 1987, and then I left right before the birth of our first daughter, Jen, in 1996. And was it very clear to you that you wanted to do that, or was that a hard thing to do? It was beyond clear to me that I was going to leave. And in fact, I write in the book about how I surprised Bill a little bit with that decision. So we got pregnant and uh, we were on a trip in China. We obviously both knew I was pregnant. It was a, a fun personal trip with other couples. And on the way home, we took a stop in Hawaii to have a little bit of personal time alone. And so Bill and I then started to talk about, okay, what's our life going to be like now with child? We, we wanted to have children. And I said, you know, I am going to quit Microsoft. And I just floored him. He was like, what? You're going to quit Microsoft? Because he knew how much I loved my job and how much pleasure I got out of it. And he liked me being there. And I just said to him at the time, no, no, no. Look, if you're going to be the CEO of Microsoft, it would be different if you were in a different company and a lower level job, but you are the CEO of a company. If we want our children to have the values that you and I have both discussed during the time of our dating and our engagement and our early marriage, somebody has to be home. And, you know, I knew he was traveling a lot and gone a lot. And so I made that decision and it surprised him. And as Bill says, when Melinda makes a decision, she is certain of herself. And he encouraged me after the birth of Jen, though, hey, you should start to find out what your other passions are because you do love the piece of work. And he really helped me. He helped nudge me into finding my other passions and keeping that side of me alight. And I am so glad for that. You mentioned that there was a point at which you decided to step forward publicly and get as involved in the public image of the foundation as you had been behind the scenes all along. When was that and what was that like? Well, I was just beginning to step forward some probably in 2003 or 2004. I was starting to do some speeches and I tell a sweet story in the book where Bill and I were both speaking to a global health convention that happened to be at the Seattle Convention Center. And he was going to speak first, and I was going to be, speak second. And we both thought it was important that we both speak. And I was so nervous, so nervous. And I said that to Bill at home, and he said, well, what are you most nervous about? I said, speaking in front of you. And he said, well, what can I do? And I said, well, we're going together, and we're leaving together. I said, why don't you, after you give your speech, leave, drive around the block, and come back and pick me up? And that is exactly what he did. He spoke. And then he got in his car, he drove around the block downtown several times, and then he came back and picked me up curbside. I did my speech, it went really well, and we went home. And so that was one of my early forays into speaking. Then as the foundation, when Warren Buffett's money came in, we announced that in 2006, the three of us were speaking to the press about what that would mean. And as I got prepared for that and started doing that and spoke about it, I realized how passionate I was about the work at this very detailed level. And I think in some ways, answering those questions helped me realize how deep I was into the foundation, even more deeply than Bill was, because he was running Microsoft. And I started to realize after that, I needed to build my skills, start speaking more. And then really, it was in 2012, where I came out very publicly on behalf of contraceptives. I was leading an initiative with the UK government and other partners to raise over $2 billion on behalf of contraceptives for women, which I totally believe in. And that's when I took a very public-facing role that I knew I would never turn back from. And in particular, you grew up in the Catholic Church. And at that point, the Catholic Church spoke up about your decision to do that because you were quite a public figure. How did you square that for yourself? Yes. So in the two years leading up to July 2012, when we made this announcement and we were garnering the resources, we were figuring out our plans, I had to really wrestle with my Catholic faith. And I spoke with many people, former nuns and priests, scholars. I spoke with my parents deeply about this and my belief in contraceptives, their belief in contraceptives. And I finally decided after a lot of self-reflection and time and quiet that 
if I believe from my faith in faith and action, I needed to live my values out in the world. And I had to live my beliefs out in the world. And my belief is that contraceptives, I know, save the lives of women and children. And I use them myself. And if I want to be a fully integrated person in society and walk the talk and have my faith in action, I had to speak out for what I truly believed, even though my church doesn't believe it. And so after I spoke out, and it did, it took a lot of courage to do that. But after I spoke out, then the Catholic Church in their big Romana paper that comes out in the Vatican newspaper came out and said that I was misguided, misinformed, etc. And I expected they would say something. And it was interesting because one of the U.S. publications wrote shortly thereafter that it proved I could take a punch in the gut. And I never thought of it that way, but I thought, yeah, okay, they, they spoke up for what they believed, and I spoke up for what I not only believe in, but what I know from my deep travels around the world. And I honestly have this belief that if Catholic priests traveled and were out in the places that I am, townships, rural areas, villages, places where women and men are telling you about women dying in childbirth because their babies came too soon and too often, I actually think they changed their belief. But they're not as out as much as I am. And so I have to live what I believe in. If you enjoyed listening, subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners find the show. And remember, we'd like to hear from you. How do you choose what to share about yourself at work? Send us a voice memo to hellomonday at linkedin.com or post your thoughts on LinkedIn with the hashtag Hello Monday. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Laura Sim with reporting by Caroline Fairchild. The show is mixed by Joe DeGiorgi. Florencia Iriando is head of editorial video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Our music was by Poddington Bear in Pachyderm. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. Thanks for listening.